Welcome to Elevate, the podcast where we dissect exceptional achievers who are consistently raising the bar personally and professionally to produce extraordinary results in investment real estate and ultimately in their lives. Now, here's your host, Tyler Chesser. Elevate Nation, welcome back. This is Tyler Chester. I'm so thankful to have you here. And I want to ask you a question. Are you ready to take it to another level? Because I know I am. And I know Dan Hanford is. And Dan, I want to welcome you to the show. And how are you doing today, sir? Doing great, Tyler. Really appreciate you having me on and uh, looking forward to being able to share with your audience. Well, absolutely. And, um, you know, I really, really appreciate having you on. Looking forward to diving into a great discussion here. And before that, I want to welcome Elevate Nation back to the show where our mission is to identify and apply how the best of the best raise the bar personally and professionally to achieve greatness in real estate and beyond. And this, of course, is a real estate masterclass for leaders and those looking to achieve uncommon results and purposeful outcomes through real estate investing and ultimately in their lives. And if you appreciate what, appreciate what we are doing, we would appreciate if you subscribe to the show, if you gave us a rating, a five-star you know, rating, a review. It certainly helps us because at the end of the day, you know, I say this time in and time out, we're, we're, we're looking to reach millions of people because most people just plug it in, man. Most people are just tolerating their life. And we want to be the uncommon few. We want to be the, the leaders and, and, you know, those who are showing that, you know, there's really a different path and it could be through real estate. It could be through elevating your mindset, your own psychology, your network, uh, your understanding, your wisdom. And so that's what we're looking to um, really kind of get out of this show. And, and I think we've got a great show for you today. And before we dive in, I want to introduce you to Dan, uh, Dan Hanford and his wife, Danae. Am I pronouncing that right? Did That's I? correct. Excellent. Along with their four children, three girls and a boy and a standard poodle reside and work in Columbia, South Carolina, beautiful Columbia, South Carolina. And Dan is one of the managing partners of PassiveInvesting.com, which is a national passive apartment investing firm based in the Carolinas. He has led apartment syndication company to acquire over 2,000 units with a portfolio valued over $220 million in just under 24 months. He's also a passive apartment investor himself in 4,100 plus units and 15 different syndication investments located across the Southeast USA and Texas. Prior to getting started in investing in real estate, Dan had an extensive background in starting multiple seven-figure businesses from scratch, including a large group of non-surgical orthopedic medical clinics located in South Carolina. Dan is also the founder of Multifamily Investor Nation, hashtag MFIN, where he provides free multifamily education to nationwide group of over 21,000 members. The Multifamily Investor Nation has over 54 meetup groups across the country that meets on, a, on the first Monday of every month, which is such a fantastic idea. Uh, he also has one of the most popular apartment investing podcasts on iTunes called Multifamily Investor Nation, where he only interviews active multifamily investors that have closed a deal in the last 12 months. There is no fluff on this multifamily podcast and only getting down to the nuts and bolts of deal sources, financing, structuring, investor relations, closing, due diligence, etc. So you can visit multifamily mfinpodcast.com. So that's not multifamily mfin, it's mfinpodcast.com to learn more about that and to subscribe. And so, so Dan, uh, you know, I know we've really kind of only scratched the surface here on your bio. And, you know, one of the things that we like to do here on Elevate is really kind of dig in and get to know you as a person behind, you know, what you do here. And so I'd be curious to know, you know, who, who is Dan Hanford as a man beyond the bio? Sure, sure. So, um, I, I, I guess I can dive into a little bit about, uh, my family as well. We kind of touched on it a little bit in the very beginning, but yep. you know, I'm, 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 I've been married for the last, you know, 12, 13 years now and, you know, have four, you know, lovely children. We have our, our dog, you know, but our children are, are fairly young. So we have a, a nine-year-old, seven-year-old, and then a three-year-old and a one-year-old. So life is, is fairly busy in that realm. But you know, my, my background, you know, in a nutshell has really been all about trying to build businesses and, you know, building them from scratch and then getting them to a point where they can actually cash flow uh, to be able to kind of go into, you know, this, this, the, the, the real estate uh, investing to be able to reduce the taxable liability. So, but in a nutshell, that's kind of who I am. 
That's awesome, man. And, uh, and that it is, it's always good to know like who somebody is like in a family life. And the reason why I ask those type of questions and why I enjoy having those type of conversations on the podcast is because real estate is that vehicle, right? And it's a vehicle for, you know, providing for your family and providing more than just survival means is to thrive and to, you know, to, you know, service your own why, right? And it could be your family could be beyond that. But um, I love that. And you talked about, you know, your background has really been through building businesses from scratch. And then beyond that, what you identified through real estate is that, you know, it can perhaps, you know, reduce your taxable uh, income there and sort of be a, a haven there in many ways. Is that how you got inter, uh, introduced into the business of real estate? It is. And, you know, it's interesting because, you know, there's obviously um, multiple reasons why people get into real estate. You know, some people do it for, you know, the, the feel to have, you know, financial freedom and some people do it to you know, be able to provide for their family. And, you know, I, I'm doing it primarily from the tax side of things so I can keep more of what we make from the businesses that we have. And yes, it does do all those other things as well. But um, at the end of the day, the main and primary reason why I got into, you know, multifamily real estate was to be able to reduce my taxable liability because, you know, it, I have these non-surgical orthopedic clinics here in South Carolina. I also have an online company that does seven figures of revenue. We're selling products, you know, all across the world. And obviously making money off of those businesses is co was causing me to have to write these large six-figure checks to the government. And I wanted to try to figure out a way to start to reduce that taxable liability. And obviously, if you look at how the IRS wrote the tax code, it's, it benefits people who are investing in real estate tremendously with you know cost segregation abil you know, abilities to be able to do depreciation and basically investing money and showing paper losses at the end of the year due to that depreciation. So is that why you got involved as a passive investor initially? It is. It is. So obviously, as a passive investor, you don't get as big as big of a benefit because you can only offset other passive gains. Uh, but it's definitely nice to be able to invest money into a property, even passively, and then to be able to you know make money off of that investment and then not have to pay any taxes on it because you're using depreciation to offset that. It's unlike any other type of investment that is out there, which is which is one of the main reasons why I like investing in it is because of you know, the cash flows that you make off of it and you don't have to pay taxes on those cash flows because you can defer it for many, many years, if not forever, depending on if you hold on to those, you keep on 1031 exchanging your money until you die. And then all of a sudden the money, the actual um, value of that investment, the basis, and it gets reset to the current value of the property uh, whenever you pass away and you turn it over to your children. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the middle of doing a 1031 exchange myself. And I'm very cognizant of the fact that it's a great program. If you do it right, you know, you can defer that gain forever, perhaps. And when you leave this earth, you give your, you know, your children or your heirs, you know, a, you know, a reset in the basis to where at that point, you know, there is no gain, and then you've built generational wealth. And, you know, but I also am very cognizant of the fact that it's like, hey, just don't do a deal just to do a deal. and Don't let the, you know, as as many other wise folks in this industry say, let the tax tail wag the dog, so to speak. And, you know, I'm trying to be very cognizant of that because I don't want to just do a deal so I can avoid this gain. So I think that's just something that I've been dealing with that hopefully, you know, others can find value in themselves. But another just nugget of wisdom that I was able to come across is a book called Tax Free Wealth by uh, Tom Wheelwright, you know, in the in the Rich Dad Advisor community. So if anybody is looking to kind of, you know, arm themselves in addition to obviously, you've got to have a great tax strategy team. Uh, you know, obviously, you want to outsource a lot of the the advisory stuff. But you, as the asset manager, I'm sure Dan, you would agree. I mean, you, you've got to be aware of the mechanisms at play here. And you've got to be able to you know, work with your team as an informed player, you know, the more that I learn, the more I can say, Hey, look, you know, I agree with this move. Let's go ahead and do that. Uh, because what you don't know, what you don't know. I mean, has that been your experience, Dan? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you have to make sure you surround yourself with people that are smarter and wiser than you as you can balance decisions off of. It's hard to know all of the answers for every different piece that you're working in. And, you know, especially when it comes to, you know, the tax side of things, you know, that that book by Tom Will Wright, I haven't personally read it, but I know a lot of people who have who have enjoyed that book. You know, there's another one that I'd recommend to listeners as well called Killing Sacred Cows by Garrett Gunderson. It's another great book. Uh, for people to read, to be able to you know look at, or read, um, to actually learn about various tax strategies, not just real estate, but even just other types of things like you know um, uh, conservation easements and uh, ins uh, what the, the insurance, I can't remember the insurance policy one. 
um, can't remember the name of that, but um, uh, the name just slips right off my mind, but it has a lot of different ideas in it as far as different ways to preserve your own wealth and to be able to pass that on and have generational wealth for, for many, many generations. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's all about the outcome, right? I mean, who cares how you get there? Captive insurance. That's what it is. Captive <laughs> insurance. Okay. I just remember, remembered it. Yeah. Well, I've, I've been learning a little bit about, you know, uh, infinite banking and those kind of things. I'm yep. definitely not qualified to be talking on that subject because it's still early, at least in my own uh, investigation. But look, there's so many ways to be able to protect your wealth. And if you're just ignorant, if you just say, Hey, look, you know, we're just going to do what we're going to do. And at the end of the day, we're going to pay our taxes. Of course, you should be paying your taxes. But you know, don't you don't necessarily have to ignore the tax law that says, look, there's benefits here. And so act the way the IRS wants you to act and you're going to be benefited. And so uh, I really appreciate you bringing that up. So so Dan, I want to do a little bit of a transition. Um, you know, obviously, somebody like yourself, I mean, you've really struck me as somebody who's I mean, you're doing big things. I mean, we talked about multifamily investor nation, you got 21,000 members, you've got multiple different online businesses that have given you this very quality problem of, you know, sheltering income from a tax perspective, which is all great issues to have. But you know, obviously, you got to a point where you have become so driven. I mean, was there a point in your life where you really said, look, I am not accepting an ordinary life, I'm not going to be a common type of guy, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to be extraordinary, and I'm going to seek excellence in everything I do. Was there a moment or was it sort of a process that got you there? No, I would say I don't really ever remember having like an, a moment in my past where I kind of thought about that. But you know, I, I do, I don't necessarily remember the exact time or whatever, but I do remember, you know, over the years, just, you know, thinking about, you know, the fact that, you know, at this point in my, where I am right now, I could stop and just, and just not do anything else if I wanted to. Um, but I don't feel like that's what I was put on this earth to do, right? I feel like I was put on this earth to continue to produce and continue to, you know, succeed in various avenues. And, you know, the Lord has actually put a lot of different things in my plate and in my, in my circles that has allowed me to have a lot of different opportunities. And, you know, I have to make sure that the gifts that I am given, I'm actually using those gifts. And, uh, and if I, cause if I don't, then I'm not fulfilling the purpose that I have um, for, for this, for this earth. And I think you see that a lot with a lot of, you know, high level, you know, people, you know, I don't want to equate myself with somebody like Elon Musk or, you know, Jeff Bezos or, you know, Bill Gates or anything like that. But, you know, all of those, those, those people don't have to do what they do anymore. They could stop, but they're not doing what they do because of the money. And I think that a lot of people miss that is that, you know, the, 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 the to me, what I have found is, is that I enjoy the process of getting getting to the point of building something and growing something and allowing it to get to the where get to where it is. And so I, I like to be able to have more, lots of different things going on. I like to be able to make different decisions. I heard somebody recently say that, you know, they, they enjoy doing what they do and, and running their own business and, and having the, the flexibility and the freedom that they have because they feel like whenever that what they're doing right now, it's almost like their own they're, they're, they're playing their own game, right? They can, they can go in and they can, yeah. you know, make decisions on this or that, or, you know, hire this person, fire that person. And it's kind of a, a game that they're playing of kind of moving different pieces and parts around. And it's see is actually very, very fulfilling for somebody who that is their actual purpose of, of being on this earth. Are you someone who is looking to seriously elevate your life this year? I mean, now this year, 2020, because I want to let you know that I am currently opening up a few coaching spots for people like you who want to close the gap from where you are to where you want to be. And I want to invite you to visit coachwithtyler.com. Again, that's coachwithtyler.com. I have to tell you, this is not for everyone. This is only for those who are defiantly committed, those who are decisive, those who are coachable, those who are resourceful. They're willing to do whatever it takes. They're willing to sacrifice time, energy, and invest resources into themselves to get to where they want to be, to live life at the highest level, and to elevate to a life without limits, exactly what we talked about on this show. If that is you, I invite you to visit coachwithtyler.com. Again, that's coachwithtyler.com. I really like the, the thoughts of, you know, that you mentioned earlier about just using the gifts that you're given um, and honoring that because, you know, sometimes you do see it sometimes where people kind of say, all right, well, it's time to lay in the shade and you know, just kind of relax and we've made it and that kind of stuff. And, and, you know, I think the, sometimes the lack of humility will come back to humble them in, in some ways, perhaps. And, 
you know, I know that's a, that's a vague statement, but I also do think that it is, you know, you have to honor the gifts that you're given, whether or not you've made it completely financially or otherwise, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a really great sort of nugget of wisdom there. And then also at the end of the day, it is about the process too. I mean, that's one of the things that I've, I've learned through my early journey here is that, you know, you get started because you are looking to make money. You're looking for that sort of security in terms of finance. Uh, but then ultimately I found the same where it's like, once you kind of, you know, reach a certain level, you do start to enjoy that process. And further to that, one thing that I've recognized is that I've just enjoyed, you know, becoming a better you know version of myself. I don't know if that's been your experience as well, but that's almost been one of these things where it's like, I didn't truly expect that. Um, but it's like the more that I've gone through the ring of fire, so to speak, and the more challenges that I've overcome, it's like, wow, you know, I know that I can handle another challenge, uh, you know, as we continue to go, as I build another system, as I build another process. So uh, I just wanted to to make those those couple of notes there. But I wanted to fast forward now just a little bit um, for your business now. I know you guys are doing big things in different areas in terms of education as well as acquisitions and just running that syndication business. So I'd be curious to know, um, what's an example of how you've raised maybe one, one substantial way that you've raised the bar in your current business to kind of elevate your own results and what you're doing? Sure. So I, I think that, you know, whenever you look at something, it's, it's hard to any type of business, it's hard to say there was just one thing. Um, because there's yep. so many different things that I feel like our group does that's, that's, that's different than other people that allows us to be able to stand out and why people continue to invest with us over and over and over. Um, so I, I, if I was to put one thing on it, I would say it would have to be the level of transparency and communication and relationship that we provide for our investors. So with, within our multifamily investing business, you know, we try very hard not to make our investors feel like a number, right? You know, obviously they're entrusting us with a fiduciary responsibility of the, the hard earned money that they have earned over the years. And we have a big responsibility to take care of that. And and for me, if I was in that person's shoes, I'd want to have direct access to that person. I want to be able to reach out to that person if I had a problem or an issue or a question. And that's what we've done is, is, is every one of our investors that invest with us, they have my direct um, contact information. So whenever I get off a phone call with them initially, they get my cell phone number, they get my email, they get my email, they get my address, they get everything so that well, any way they can get a hold of me, they can. So I want them to feel like they are part of the family and not just, you know, a, a number that's just, you know, a, you know, wiring funds or writing a check, if you will, to be able to invest in our assets. And, you know, going along those same lines, we provide a lot of communication to our investors so they can continue to feel comfortable about the investments. And of course, we do monthly distributions and we start those distributions, you know, the, the moment we close on a property. So we're not, you know, waiting six months, a year, two years to be able to do distributions. We're starting them right away. And again, I think that's also what's helped us grow because investors are starting to see those returns right away and they're feeling, they feel more comfortable to be able to invest in the next project that we have instead of waiting six months or a year. I, like I've seen on some projects where, you know, it could be, you know, two years before they see their first check and, you know, and I've invested in some of those properties. So I, I think you said in the introduction, I've been 15 different passive syndications right now. I'm actually, I've already invested in three more since I wrote that. So I'm actually at 18 right now, but um, in each, I mean, I've been inside of some of those that take a long time to invest in. And honestly, I haven't invested with that sponsor again until I start to see the return. I start to see that they've started to perform. And so that's another kind of, you know, thing that we do that kind of, you know, sets us apart and that I, that I truly believe has allowed us to be able to grow and scale. But, you know, kind of an, another thing that I'm just thinking about is obviously, you know, how professional our group is and how we put together our presentations for investors and, and have that level of detail with our investors so they feel comfortable investing with us. Is there a specific way that you, um, have you ever felt like a number yourself in an investment? And um, what did that learning sort of communicate to you? And how did you use that sort of uh, experience to, you know, make sort of your, your investors feel like they're part of the family and not just a number. Sure. So, you know, I actually have been in a couple of them that have, I've felt like a number. 
Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example recently as to what happened. So I, what, what, there's a group right now that I've invested with and I won't mention their name. So I, I like the group. That's why I've invested with them. But um, when I first re uh, registered for their investment portal online, which I'll tell you right now, I don't like those. Um, but again, I, I, I'll use it if I like the person and I want to invest with them, right? So our group doesn't use a portal, but I used a portal and I signed up for it and I get this auto-generated email from some rando. Like I have no clue who this person is, right? And it basically says at the end, you know, here's the information about how to sign up for the, for the investment. Thanks. XYZ investment team, right? And I'm like, investment team, like, who is this? Like, can you like tell me who I'm, who's talking to me so I know who I'm hearing from? And same thing when I get, when I got a wire confirmation from that same group, it said, you know, your wire for this particular investment has been received. Thanks, XYZ investment team. I'm like, what is that? Like, I, I don't know who I'm even talking to. So, like, I have no clue if there's an issue or a problem, who I should reach out to or whatever it'd be very easy for them that whoever wrote that email just to put their name in it. So there is a little bit more of a personal connection and relationship. And I don't do everything for our group. So I have an assistant that works with me. We have a, we have a full-time marketing director that works with us an asset manager, analyst, all these are full-time people, but our, my assistant, whenever they, he, she sends, whenever she sends out an email to one of our investors, she includes me in the email, but she also signs her own name on that email so that they know who is, who is talking to that person. So they don't think that it's me and it's really not right. So they want, I want to make sure that they have a relationship with her. They have a relationship with me as well as any of our other team members that we need to have. I mean, it's huge. At the end of the day, this is a relationship business and it, this may seem insignificant, but perhaps, you know, at times you're investing in these deals, it can be a significant amount of capital that you're wiring and you're saying, Hey, look, you know, uh, I hope that you, you look out for my best interest as a fiduciary, as you say. Um, but little simple tweaks like that, I think that's a really good, uh, really good thought. You talked also about just transparency, communication. I mean, is there anything that you feel like you guys have implemented specifically as it relates to uh, transparency that's really set your group apart? Sure. So one of the things that we do is we be very, we're very proactive in communication with our investors. So every month that an investor is in one of our properties, they are going to get an email by the 14th of every month. So not by the end of the month, not just randomly throughout the month. It's by the 14th of every month, we send out an update on how that property performed the prior month. So it includes occupancy status, it includes marketing, it includes interior, exterior innovations, photos, you know, all kinds of different updates so that they feel comfortable and they know what's going on. And that being that being that proactive allows them to know what's going on with the property instead of them having to reach out to us all the time and asking us, hey, how's the property performing? And then in those same monthly updates on a quarterly basis, we'll release the financials, the T12, the rent roll. That way they can, again, see, see additional financial you know, information. And uh, we always tell the investors, like anytime, even though we just release those quarterly, at any time throughout the process, if you want to see something, you just let us know. We'll get it to you and however you want to see it. Um, we're not trying to hide anything. We don't want to be hiding anything. We want to have that complete transparency with you. And so I think that to, to, for our investors, they like. And, you know, I had, you know, somebody actually just this morning, I was on a phone call with somebody and I told him how many investors we had in one of our projects. And he said, like, do you like managing that many investors? And I'm like, honestly, because of the level of communication that we give them, we don't have a lot of issues. I rarely get questions from our investors. The number one question I get from investors is, hey, can I change my distribution information? Like they want to change from one bank account to the next. And it's not that big a deal. We send them a DocuSign document they fill it out and we send it over and it gets changed out and it's done so and it's not even a lot there like maybe once a month we get somebody that wants to do that um, so for me it's a lot of it it's just about communication and transparency and that's what we do to do that yeah I mean this is this is a really good reminder as well is that you know when you are proactive you don't have to worry about being reactive I mean so so many different groups or different businesses are reactive to the point where it becomes more work if you just if you just build in your systematic approach it's like look we know we're going to have to communicate you know you can't just take money from an investor and put it into a deal and then expect them to not be curious about what's happening with their money so uh, I love that thought and, and kind of building that uh, regimen into your schedule. It's like, look, by the 14th of the month, you will receive a communication. 
quarterly, you will receive the financials. You can expect that. Of course, if you want anything more than that, just let us know. So that's a great, uh, great nugget for everyone listening to the show. I want to switch gears just slightly, um, Dan, just re- regarding, you know, you as a businessman, as an entrepreneur, as a family man, I mean, doing so many different things to be able to accomplish what you're accomplishing, continuing to strive for. Obviously, you've got to limit your inputs and limit your outputs, right? So how are you saying no? I mean, is there, has there been an example of anything recently that you've had to say no to? And was there a process to, to get you to that point? Sure. So you know, everything I always balance right now is, as I real, I, I figure out, you know, if there's an opportunity that comes across my desk or an opportunity or, or some sort of, you know, project, I always look at it and see, is it something that's going to be able to move the needle for where I want to be able to be? And is it going to, is it, is it something that is going to take me, take more time away from my family that I don't really need to do? Cause at this point I don't need to do it. So I don't, I, if it's not, to me, it's not about the money. Um, you know, I even had somebody reach out to me recently, wanted to, wanted to pay me, you know, several hundred dollars an hour to do some consulting work with them. And I, and I turned them down and I said, honestly, it's not worth it to me. I said, you'd have to be paying me several thousand dollars an hour to actually, you know, take the time away from my family to be able to do that. Um, and, the, and even then we'd have to you know, schedule it out in a, in a specific way that would fit my schedule, not yours. And, and so the biggest thing for me has been, you know, people every single week reach out to me and say, Hey, do you do any coaching? Do you do any mentoring? And, you know, and I, and I say no to that every single time. And I've even, even, you know, some of our, when we have two other managing partners in our group, you know, people have reached out to them as well. And we've just made a decision that we're not going to do that. Um, there's, there's several other people in the space that they, they, they like doing that. They, they want to do that and that's perfectly fine. But our, our group is solely focused on acquisitions and acquiring properties and, you know, you know, providing phenomenal returns for our investors. And, you know, we could go out there and do some one-on-one coaching and mentoring and make a little bit of money, but it's not worth it to us. And so at the end of the day, we have to balance that and say, you know, number one, we don't have the time for it. Number two, we don't need the money. So why would we do it? Um, so that's an example of something you know, that, that has been occurring for a while now. And obviously, I'm going to continue to get people asking me about that because of the, the education that I provide with our multifamily investor nation group. But, you know, I, I just tell people that I'm, I'm not doing the multifamily investor nation group to sell coaching or consulting services or anything like that. You know, my, my primary goal and purpose of that is to be able to educate people around various things in multifamily and you know, a lot of people, when they start to investigate it, eventually they'll see that there's a lot of different moving pieces and parts and a lot of different things that you have to do. And they would rather just invest passively. And so that's where we come along and can help them from a passive standpoint as well. Yeah. So when you say moving the needle, like for you, that ties back to your overall vision for your business, your overall vision for your life and how you're providing for your family, I would imagine. Is that, am I correct on that? Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's lots of different things that for me, you know, moves the needle for me. So, um, you know, I've, I actually had, even had somebody recently, we actually, I just started a nonprofit organization that uh, is something that I'm very passionate about. And one of the, somebody actually reached out to me recently and said, Hey, would you be willing to help us with our group if we donated to your organization? And I said, well, yeah, absolutely. Let's do it. You know, so that's also helping move the needle in, a, in, a, in, a, in the nonprofit realm where I can still provide my time, but it's being, it's benefiting the nonprofit at the same time too. I like that. I mean, it, it just goes back to, you know, having a clear vision for what you're looking to accomplish and making decisions based on that. If you don't have that vision, if you don't have that outcome for, you know, maybe it's a, a short-term goal or maybe it's a lifetime goal or vision, you know, then you're able to make those decisions better. And it's, it's funny because I do, I ask that specific question because I want to get better at it because I get all these inbound things and I'm not saying that to brag or anything. I mean, I think many people in our space are in that, in that space of, you know, just so much inbound to where it's like, Hey, you cannot say yes to everything. And once you do, things are going to crumble in many different directions. So I appreciate you uh, giving us a lot of transparency on that. Um, Beyond that, um, Dan, I'd love to know about habits. I mean, what's a, you know, what's, you know, maybe one of your top habits that you think is extremely important for you to be able to do what you do on a daily basis? Sure, sure. So one of the things which you probably never have had anybody say this to you before, but one of the things that really I I do on a daily basis is I take time in the morning when I first wake up, I sit down and I actually enjoy time 
with my wife. So we have a nice cup of coffee. We have two chairs that are sitting in our, in our living room between our master bedroom and our kitchen that overlooks the back porch. And, you know, we, we our kids are upstairs sleeping and, you know, still sleeping. And so we get up a little early and, and just enjoy that that one-on-one interaction and that conversation. And for me, I mean, you know, we've been doing it for many years now. So it's been one of those things that uh, when we don't do it for a couple of days, it gets, it's like, no, I, I want to get back at it, you know, and it kind of helps me get started. And, and it's been good because, you know, I kind of, I, she tells me what she's going to do for the day. And she, I tell her what I'm going to be doing for the day. And we kind of, you know, balance things off of each other and really kind of provide that, you know, consulting with each other on various aspects of what we're going to do throughout the day. And for me, that's been something that's really helped me and, you know, not being able to have her alongside me through this ride would have been a lot harder. And so having her with me and, and, and guiding me and directing me and, you know, balancing different ideas off of has been very beneficial for, for the growth that we've had. Yeah, my, my, my fiance and I, Katie, we do that as well. We have coffee and just, we actually sit down and we say, hey, what are three things you're grateful for today? And what are three things you're grateful for in the future? You know, just kind of challenging each other to think through what are our goals? What are we striving for? And I just, I do like the thought of, you know, building in that kind of time, whether it's on a daily basis or even, you know, I've had other folks that I really respect say, hey, look, you know, we've got date night and we, we, we guard that, you know, in, in any way we can, we've got a babysitter and we're going to get out of the house. We're going to go do something. It may not be a fancy dinner every single time, but uh, I think guarding your primary relationship is so important to be able to, you know, not only obviously enjoy that and grow your love with this other person, but, you know, to support you. And if you're trying to do big things, I think, like you said, it's so key to have that kind of support and that kind of collaboration. Uh, from someone that you know that you can 100% trust. So uh, that's, that's awesome. Um, tell me about an investment in yourself that you've made over the past few years that's really paid a lot of dividends for you. Sure. So I actually, uh, you know, probably five or six years ago, started doing a, a paid mastermind in the business sector. So it wasn't necessarily in real estate, but it was just in the business sector. And it was actually myself and a good friend of mine down in Florida that started this mastermind together. And we started to you know, bring some people in. And what we found out very quickly was, is that in, when we did a group like that, it was really him and I being the coaches to these other people that were in the mastermind. And so we, so we weren't really finding the benefit of it. And we weren't really doing it for the money. It was more just to try to get a bunch of high level people together. And so I called him up one day and I said, listen, I said, I honestly get the most value and benefit from you. So uh, I have a feeling that you probably are the same way with me. And I said, so why don't we just not invite anybody else in and it just be you and I getting together and just mastermind about our various businesses and our lives. And he's very similar to me as far as being married. He's got three children. They're all about the same age. And so uh, we decided to, and he's like, you know, I was thinking the same thing. And so we just decided to go ahead and start doing that. And so for the last five or six years now, about four times a year, usually three or four times a year, we get together in just various spots, just just him and I, and just really brainstorm on our, on our, on our businesses and how we can continue to grow and scale. And that's, to me, one of the things that has really allowed us to be able, both of us, to be able to uh, grow and scale our own lives and our own businesses. So just out of curiosity, I mean, how do you structure that with two members? I mean, are you paying a pot and saying, all right, now we're going to pay for our travel and we're going to plan to go on these different, you know, meetups in various different locations? I mean, just out of curiosity. Yeah. So obviously, you know, it's, it's a lot easier when there's two people because you can always just split the costs and stuff. But yeah. um, we actually created our own separate entity together where we own it 50%, uh, 50-50. And so whenever there's expenses, that entity pays for it and then we just fund the, the entity. But it's a zero profit entity, obviously. But of course, um, we just created that entity just for that purpose so we could share those expenses and be able to write those off. That's awesome. I actually, uh, I have a similar you know, a friend, you know, a friend who's in a similar stage of his career that I am that we have calls monthly. And um, it's, it's just like that. I mean, you're kind of bouncing ideas like, hey, this is not working for me right now. This is working for me. You know, how would you deal with this? And just having somebody who's non biased, who doesn't have anything to profit from you, they just want to see you succeed. And you can also help them in a different way. I think it's so valuable. So that's actually, uh, I hadn't actually thought of mine as a mastermind. But uh, maybe we need to take it to the next level ourselves. So I love yeah, that. I mean, I think I think it is. I mean, anytime yeah. you put you know two mind, two or more minds together, it creates yep. that mastermind. And 
you know, I think, uh, you know, the biggest thing is, is trying to find that, that person that really connects with you because there, it is, it is hard as an entrepreneur in the business world to find that person because, you know, it's not your, your everyday friend. It's hard to have conversations with, you know, and, yeah. and, you know, to give you an example, you know, if we, if, if in our, the clinics that I own, if we have a down month, you know, we might lose, you know, 10,000 or $15,000. Well, you know, that's not going to really relate. There's not a lot of people that can relate to that, you For know, sure. in, a, in, in certain circles that are just my you know regular friends, you can't go to them and say, oh, yeah, I just, I, I just lost 15,000 last month. And you know, they're yeah. thinking they didn't even make that last quarter, you know, or however, sure. however much, whatever their salaries are and stuff. But so it, it is important to find that, that person that you can really confide in that, you know, doesn't have a, you know, financial gain or, or one from one way or another. And, and I will say this, that we've had, between the two of us, my friend and I, um, we have not had, we, we have had multiple opportunities come across our, 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 our desk with our masterminds where we could have been in business together. And we have purposely made it a point not to be in business together because we don't want to number one, ruin our relationship and our friendship. And so we wanted to make sure that we did not have a business together. So obviously with the mastermind, it's, it's a zero profit entity. We're not trying to make money off of it. That's totally different. But when we're trying to, you know, start a new business, we purposely make sure that we're not involved with each, each other's businesses. Well, I mean, to your point earlier, one of the things that I found so challenging as I became an entrepreneur, because I didn't have an entrepreneurial background, I didn't have family that really kind of endeavored in that kind of space. I didn't have a whole lot of background in it. So as I came up, just to give you kind of my reference point was, it was very challenging. I mean, I have times where you lose money. It's like, wait a minute, oh my gosh, you know, and like your, your psychological takeover of, you know, sort of flight or fight or flight and you got to survive and these kind of things. And you start to, you don't have anybody you can turn to. It's like, no one else understands this. And so having that sort of person that you can confide in and strategize with and mastermind and kind of take advantage of larger opportunities, is so important and I can't be overstated. And so that's, that's really, really wise. I appreciate you sharing that. Beyond that, I mean, you talked about, you know, at, at times you have, you know, there can be challenging periods, right? There could be negative cash flow. There could be, you know, unforeseen challenges. Just out of curiosity, I mean, has there been any failures that you've experienced that have really been kind of a, a seed for a later success for you? Well, I mean, I, I can, there's one that I point to very regularly that I can say that when we, when we first started our first clinic, you know, it's a lot, it's not as, as hard to, you know, watch the numbers when you have just one clinic, when we started to grow and scale to the second, third and fourth one, we, we learned some things after the second one, which it actually took us after the second clinic, it took us another year to open up the third one. And then the fourth one was, you know, three or four months later after that. But the, the, the main thing that we learned or that we, the biggest mistake that we made as a group and primarily me was that we took, and, and when we had just one clinic, we were looking at the, the numbers on a quarterly basis, right? And it was, and that was fine because we had a lot more insights into the day-to-day -day operations. We kind of knew how things were happening, things, what things were doing. But then when we opened up the second clinic, looking at things on a quarterly basis actually hurt us because we took our eye off of the first clinic and started the second clinic and didn't look at the numbers until at the end of the quarter, which obviously when you're doing that, you're doing retrospective analysis. And so yeah. at that point, it was already too late. We already lost quite a bit of revenue because we took our, our eye off of that first clinic. And so we made that mistake once and never made it again. So when we started the second clinic, we actually started to do monthly, you know, look at, looking at the numbers on a monthly basis. And then when we scaled to the third and fourth clinic, we actually now look at them on a weekly basis. So every single week, we're actually looking at them. And that same philosophy is the same philosophy that we use in our, in our multifamily business as well, where we're not looking at the financial numbers on our assets on a quarterly basis, which I know a lot of groups do. And that's one of the reasons why they do quarterly distributions. But the problem is, is if you only look at the numbers on a quarterly basis, then it's too late to sometimes make changes or pivots when you're only looking at them on a quarterly basis. And even monthly is too late. You got to look at them on a weekly basis and also have on-site people who are looking at them every single day, right? And those types of assets. So you know when to pivot uh, whenever you need to pivot when those things start to show up in the numbers. Yeah. I mean, when you look at financials at the end of the month, it's too late. I mean, it's already happened. This is what it is. I mean, certainly you can influence how that may 
end up for the next month, but you're maybe even too late for that at that point. So I think it's really important. It's a really key takeaway is to be on top of it on a consistent basis and, you know, weekly and even, you know, folks in the organization on a more frequent, even a daily basis. One of the things that I learned, you know, a couple of years ago, I read a book called Traction. And my company, we have a scorecard that we look at on a weekly basis. And it, not all of it has to do with revenue or expenses or net income or anything like that. You know, a lot of it has to do with well, what can we control? You know, what are, what are some of our key performance indicators, our KPIs that we can look at and say, hey, you know, where do we need to tweak right now to influence what it's going to look like at the end of the month, at the end of the quarter, or at the end of the year? And so that was a, a really big distinction for myself. But but I think it does go back to being consistent, being proactive, as you said earlier. I mean, I think, um, you know, because if you're just looking at a quarterly basis, that's kind of a reactive uh, standpoint. That's kind of a, yes. you know, you're looking at what's already happened and you're well into the next quarter. So uh, I can see that being very challenging, especially at how much competition there is in this marketplace for liquidity, for capital, for deals. I mean, you've got to set yourself apart from being pro as being proactive, you know, as being someone who's ahead of the game, who's influencing the numbers. So that's a, there's a lot of wisdom there. Uh, so Dan, tell me about who, um, who are your role models? I mean, do you have role models in business or in life in general? And if so, who are they? Um, I don't know if I would necessarily, you know, say I'd have any role models, models, models per se, but you know, one, uh, uh, you know, I'll tell you about a, a book that I read recently that has really kind of, you know, helped kind of change my mindset. And I wouldn't necessarily call this person a role model, but I do like the way he thinks. It's, it's Grant Cardone with the 10X rule book. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, his whole concept with that 10X rule is being able to think about things in a different level so that you can start to ask more questions to allow you to get to the next level. Because a lot of times when we have certain amount, certain level of thinking, for example, if we're, if we have a $5 million a year business and we're trying to get to the $6 million level, there's a few questions you have to answer to get to that next you know, level of revenue. But if you ask yourself, how do I get to 10 million or 50 million? that is going to ask, start to have you at answering or, or, or really you know, answering, but also raising more questions that you would never thought of before, because then you start to think much bigger and much different than just how do I get to a 6 million from a 5 million. Then, you, then so it, it just puts your mindset in a different realm. And it, it uh, you know, when I, when I went to one of the conferences he put on a couple of years ago, one of the things that I, you know, came up with in my head, which I know is not new, but one of the things that I kind of came up with in my head was that the same level of thinking that has gotten us to where we are today is the same level of thinking that will prevent us from being able to get to the next level of where we need to go. And so we have to be able to constantly be thinking bigger so we can know where we're going to be able to change our change to be able to get to that next level in our lives. And, that, and that, that applies not just to business, but it applies into our spiritual life. It applies into our health, our, our, our families. I mean, it, it, it applies into multiple different levels of your life. A lot of people only focus on it in the business sector, but it does factor into multiple different areas. Yeah, um, I, that was one of my biggest takeaways as well from reading 10X Rule was just it, it's all about asking yourself bigger questions, right? And challenging yourself to take more action and substantially more action or perhaps smarter action, right? You don't always have to work harder, but you can work smarter. I mean, I think Grant Cardone would say you need to work harder and smarter if you want to go, you know, if you want to be 10X. Um, but I think it is all about your questions and that's the whole concept behind it is, you know what, if you just want, you know, nominal increases, that's not really, first of all, it's not that inspiring. So you're not going to be super driven to get out of bed every single morning and get after it and deal with, you know, major challenges as we do. But, you know, another thing that I love that he talks about is that it, you know, bigger problems, I mean, seek bigger problems. That's when you're going to have, you know, you're really going to create a great life. And so, and I also love the fact that, you know, you, you really just illustrated that role models can be found through books. I mean, books can be role models. It doesn't necessarily have to be the specific, you know, person themselves, but there's role models all around us that you can really kind of model. You don't have to recreate the wheel, but you can also gain wisdom and take action on that wisdom. That's why I say we identify and apply how the best of the best are achieving greatness in real estate and beyond on the show is because it's all about identifying, but then applying, applying that wisdom and applying, you know, 10 X, as you just mentioned. So, uh, so with that said, what's a goal that you're most proud of accomplishing over the past year or so? 
Hmm. Um, I think that uh, if I was to look back at the last 12 months and figure out, you know, our, our goal has been this year in 2019 to acquire just over a hundred million in, in acquisitions. And we actually are at 121 million, somewhere around in there uh, in far as acquisitions. And we couldn't have done that if we didn't, to close our largest property that we closed in the in, in October. So we closed a large fifty one point five million dollar property um, out of Raleigh, North Carolina, which was our largest one to date. And if we didn't close that one, I don't think, or if it, we, I don't, I don't think we would have hit that hundred million dollar goal. Right? We would have been off by probably thirty million. So mm-hmm. obviously, closing that project allowed us to be able to get over that that mark for us and it really opened our eyes to be able to see that we could actually achieve more and, you know, again, seek to that next level. Cause we actually, we raised 14 million to be able to acquire that property and did it in just under two weeks. And the one closest to that we raised was eight and a half million. So we did like 7.2 this year, eight and a half. This one was, was 14. So we almost doubled where we were on the most recent raise. And we, I think we all, all three partners kind of shocked ourselves that we were able to accomplish it, but you know, we couldn't have done it without uh, being able to, you know, have answer some of those additional questions that were created when we started to look at some of those larger assets and, you know, really, you know, we were competing with some pretty big level players, some REITs and hedge funds and you know, ultra high net worth individuals and being able to take it down was a, a big notch on our belt. And it's, it's allowed us to be able to be in the running for some other larger properties, you know, right now, hopefully sometime today or tomorrow, we'll get a notification as to whether or not we got another property in Raleigh, which is actually about a $70 million property. Jeez. So it's a little bit larger, but we wouldn't have been able to even compete with that one if we didn't have the last one that we actually closed. And we actually closed that one in 50 days. So we had, uh, 21 day due diligence and a 30 day close period with no option to extend. And so we definitely put ourselves behind the eight ball on that one, but we ended up surprising ourselves. I think even surprising the seller and being able to close a day early. Congratulations, man. That's, that's Thanks. amazing. That's uh, it's inspiring. I mean, it really, in my opinion, it probably goes back to the fact of you and your team, your partners have really kind of gotten to a point where you enjoy the process so much that things like that just happen. And you're asking these big questions that you're putting yourself in the game to be considered for massive opportunities. And, and I think at times, sometimes it's like, you know what, you control the controllables. And sometimes you, you know, there's probably a little bit of luck involved, but there's a lot of process involved for sure. And uh, it's just a good reminder there. So with that said, I'd be curious to know, is there something massive that you could inspire us with by embarking some of uh, your goals that you're working towards right now, or maybe one, maybe one large goal that you're Uh, looking to accomplish now? Yeah. So obviously in 2020, our goal is going to be higher than a hundred million. We want to get to over 200 million in 2020 um, in additional acquisitions. And then our goal is to get to a billion in assets under management over the next four more years. So that's kind of our, our, our long-term goal. And uh, each year we're having to reset our criteria and go for larger assets and acquire, you know, different types of properties that provide that provide those returns for investors. And it gets a little bit harder, the larger you go, because you have a lot more, you know, larger people that are competing with you that when you're trying to acquire them with a syndication model versus somebody who's coming there and just showing a bank account with all the money, uh, you have to answer the question to the seller of, are you sure of your equity? Can you actually get your equity? And uh, I think, you know, that's the, that's going to be the biggest question for us moving forward. Yeah, I mean, that extensive track record, you know, is certainly going to be extremely important, I would imagine, uh, as you continue to to embark upon that journey. So that's great. And uh, looking forward to following you along uh, on that. Um, so Dan, what's the driving force behind what you do overall? Well, I would say that the biggest thing that drives me is is just the pursuit of being able to be successful and being able to leave this legacy for my family. So, you know, obviously, right now, you know, I, I I feel like I'm living the dream, if you will. Like I don't have to necessarily go to the office every day, but I do it because I love to do it and I I enjoy it. And it's a very, it's a big passion of mine. Um, But right now, I I think I mentioned earlier about a 501c3 that I started, but it's not fully in the fully, you know, completed yet, but it's a a concept that I came up with about three months ago and uh, to help, you know, uh, subsidize some of the uh, private Christian school education around the country. I'm a product of private Christian school, ed- school education. And my wife's side of the family is, is, uh, is all, you know, 
three or four generations deep of Christian educators and, and on her side of the family, um, not just in education, like, you know, being a student, but also being the, the teachers in that sector. And so I, I decided to start a 501c3 nonprofit that helps to allow the, the quality of education to continue to be increased and using the funds from that to invest inside of multifamily assets to allow that to continue to grow. And to, so it's, it's kind of a, if you know anything about accredited investors, when it comes to 501c3s, they have to have at least $5 million of assets in order to be able to be considered accredited to be able to invest in these types of assets that we're doing with multifamily. And so the goal for 2020 is to be able to build that up to a $5 million in assets so we can invest that and then make scholarships off of those uh, those distributions to and to those students and those families that need it, and then also continue to grow that. So over the over, over the lifetime, it'll be one of those things that'll be and in, in perpetuity, being able to continue to improve the lives of, of Christian education across the country. That's super exciting, man. Um, and what an it's an innovative thought too. It's like, hello, we're we're obviously we've got a great product here. We're distributing and and growing wealth in so many different ways. If you can do it for a cause as well, you know, why not do that? So that's super exciting. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll definitely want to plug how we can, uh, how we can get involved with the organization uh, in the show notes. So we'll, we'll definitely connect offline uh, as it relates to that. And um, with that said, I do want to uh, transition into our rapid fire section. We call this the rare air questionnaire. And the reason why we call it that is because obviously, you know, we're theoretically scaling to the mountaintop, right? You know, most people, uh, they gave up long, long ago and, you know, their, their legs are tired, they can't breathe, but really, I mean, we've still got a long way to go and, and look, there's another mountain as well. So, uh, so I'd love to know, you know, we've talked about a few books, um, but what's the most impactful book that you've ever read and why? So I'd, I would go back to that, that 10 X rule, you know, the one that I read recently, um, there's been a lot of other like marketing books from like Dan Kennedy and things like that, that I've read that have really been beneficial for me from a, from a marketing perspective, but from a, from a high level growth mindset and being able to scale quickly, that 10 X rule book from Grant Cardone, I would, I would have to say is that, that number one book right now. We will absolutely link to that in the show notes. And I highly recommend that as well. It's a very easy book to read, but it's like you open up your mind, these limiting beliefs that you didn't really realize were there. Once you start to uncover them through, you know, getting pushed through this book, I highly recommend it as well. So that's awesome. Uh, what's the biggest way that you elevate your life on a daily basis? We talked about some of the habits. We talked about just being as committed as you are, but just out of curiosity, outside of that, What's the biggest way that you elevate your life on a daily basis? Sure. So you know, I, I, I would, you know, I, and I, I hate keep on going back to what I've already said, but, you know, uh, you know, spending time with making sure that I make time to spend time with my family, I feel like is, is the number one thing that I do to elevate my life because they are, again, the reason why I do what I do. And, you know, even just, just yesterday, I was sitting down at the dinner table and, you know, all kinds of, 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 of energy throughout the house. I got my son running around, you know, pretending that he's, he's flying an airplane. I got my, my daughter, you know, pulling on me, wanting, wanting, wanting a little bit more to eat. And I got another, another, another one running around with my son and just all this stuff going on. I just sat back and just like, just let it sink in, you know, this like That's surreal fun. moment of all this stuff going on and just going, you know, this, this is it. This, this is, this is the reason, you know? That's awesome, man. That just sounds fun. Invite me over next time that happens. I want to, <laughs> I want to soak in on that one too. Uh, but it is, it's a, it's also a good reminder. I mean, we all get so busy, but if you're not, if you don't guard it, if you don't create that time, if you don't carve it out, it's not going to happen. Right. Well, I would say just kind of going back, I was just thinking about, you know, obviously you know, I talked about the dinner table and I think that a lot of times in this busyness of the world that we have right now, we, we neglect actually sitting down and having a meal with our family. Yeah. And that's one thing that my wife is very diligent about is she makes sure that, you know, three nights a week, we're sitting down having a meal together at the house at the dinner table. So the other nights were either Wednesday night at church, we're going out to eat Friday nights is usually up in the air. You know, we're not really sure what we do there, but usually at least three nights a week, we're sitting down having a meal together around our family table, having a dinner. That's awesome. So we talked about obviously the 50, is it 501C? 501C3? 
C three. What am I? I I need to I need to get my numbers here. Just call uh, it a nonprofit. <laughs> oh well, yeah, we'll call it a nonprofit. Uh, so beyond that, I mean, you do so many things, obviously, with your investors, with your family, um, you know, otherwise. But what's the best way, and how do you elevate others around you? Sure. So one of the things I always say is, is that if somebody has some question about something or needs a little bit of advice, I try to be there and be a resource for them. So not necessarily always just monetarily, but, you know, even just, you know, giving back of my time. You know, I, I even had a phone call before we jumped on here with somebody who's had a few questions for me about just multifamily syndication. He wasn't really interested in investing with us or anything, but he just had a few questions himself. And I said, no problem. Let's jump on a phone call. Let's, let's have a conversation about it. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, the, the, the value that you provide to other people just pays back in dividends and not just in, in, in you know, a monetary form. But, you know, I have I've had investors reach out to me that say, hey, I just want to let you know, I did some research on you before I jumped on a call with you. And I couldn't find anybody that said anything negative about you. And I asked multiple people in the industry and everybody says really good, positive things about you. And it's because I try to provide as much value as possible to other people and, and do what I say what I'm going to do. I love it. Any parting thoughts or words of wisdom that you would embark upon Elevate Nation today? Sure. I think a lot of people, when they're trying to elevate themselves, a lot of times they get stuck into this, you know, uh, analysis paralysis, if you will, or paralysis, you know, by analysis. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I always would encourage somebody to write down, like right now, if they're going to write anything down from this entire episode, is to realize that version one is always better than version none. And, but that doesn't mean you can't work on version 2.0, but sometimes you just have to get that version 1.0 out there so you can actually start to answer some questions about how you can create a better version of the product you're creating or of yourself. Version one is always better than version none. Love it. That's awesome, man. So, you know, take action, right? Take action and don't be worried about making mistakes. You're going to make mistakes. You'll eventually evolve to the point where version 2.0 is there or 3.0, whatever it may be. Love that parting words of wisdom. And uh, Dan, really, really appreciate you taking time to be on the show today. Uh, if and when Elevate Nation wants to stay in contact with you, how can they do that? Sure. They can do it a couple of different ways. So if you're interested in, in kind of following us with some of those investments that we're doing, you can obviously go to our website, passiveinvesting.com. If you have questions about anything that we've talked about today, love to be able to jump on a call with you and have the further discussion. You can just email me at dan at passiveinvesting.com. And if you're interested in just following me with some more of the multifamily education stuff that we do, weekly webinars and stuff, you can just go to multifamilyinvestornation.com and looking forward to be able to connect with you. Yeah, I highly recommend that you stay in contact with Dan and what he's doing over there at PassiveInvesting.com as well as the Multifamily Investor Nation. As he mentioned there, I mean, obviously giving so much value on a you know one-to-many basis as well as a one-to-one -one basis. So you do have the opportunity of, of connecting with Dan on a one-to-one -one basis if you would like to do that. And so thank you for uh, extending that offer. And, you know, I want to remind Elevate Nation, I mean, at the end of the day, it is about repetition. I mean, on this show, you got to listen to it a couple of times. You're going to hear something that you didn't hear originally. That's just how our mind works. I know when I reread a book, I'm like, what? I didn't even remember any of this. Like, what's going on here? Uh, so you, you want to listen to the show again. You got to take notes. And as Dan mentioned at the end, you know, write that down and, and uh, realize that version one is better than version none. I mean, you've got to take action. You've got to take massive action. So uh, until next time, thank you so much, everybody, for being here. And Dan, thanks again for being on the show. You too. Thank you so much, Tyler. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you for listening to Elevate. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and pay it forward by sharing with a friend. Most importantly, take this opportunity to elevate your results by taking immediate action on what you learned. For more, visit tylerchesser.com.